So this year, for October, we're following a, a bit of a different format. Uh, previously, we have gone out to neighbourhoods, and what we're trying to do this year, we want to focus on infrastructure. So the first question that might come to mind is, what exactly is infrastructure? And it's a whole lot of things. It can be roads, bridges, uh, streetlights, sidewalks. Underground, it can be water, sewer, storm drainage. It's also our civic facilities, so it's arenas, pools, and it's our wonderful parks and trails and sports fields. It's a huge part of what the city does, and it's the foundation for the services that we provide and for the quality of life that we have all become used to enjoying. Some particular examples of recent infrastructure that I expect most of the folks in this room are familiar with. <clears throat> Up in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see the Kearney sinkhole, which occurred the summer before last. And uh, it was uh, started out to be very small, but became a, a huge uh, sinkhole and a huge project that took most of the summer before it was repaired. And it certainly drew our attention to the need to repair and maintain our infrastructure. Over on the upper right-hand corner, we've got a water main break. That was also a, a very uh, significant break that occurred on Third Avenue. Down on the lower left, we've got the condo project on the city parkade that's occurring right beside City Hall. That's another example of a lot of infrastructure that has to be renewed and expanded. So it includes just storm sewer, sewer and water. Over on the, uh, the right lower corner of the graph, we've got our, our playground reinvestment program, which has been going very well. We took a lot of playgrounds and uh, they were no longer CSA compliant. So they were getting to the point where we wouldn't want to have our children playing on them. And so there were a number of playgrounds that were removed, and there's going to be somewhat fewer, but some beautiful new playgrounds, some of which have already been installed, and more to be installed. So uh, Prince George's infrastructure is very old and it's very spread out. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of Prince George to explain why that's the case. To begin with, in 1915, Prince George was very small both in size and in population. But after World War II, it boomed. In 1947, the population of Prince George was 4,000. 30 years later, it was 60,000. The things that caused that expansion were industrial development. The transportation infrastructure was expanded. And Prince George also became the service center for the North, which it continues to be. So some interesting facts, from the 1940s until the 1980s, the population doubled every decade. Prince George at that time was considered to be the fastest growing city in BC. By 1981, and I remember this very well, it's um, just to give you an indication of how old I am, it's the year that I graduated from university and returned to Prince George. At that time, Prince George was the seventh largest city in, Prince George, in BC. And there was only one other city outside of Metro Vancouver that was in that top seven. So the, the downside of this growth was uh, it affected planning a bit. Prince George had its first official community plan in 1979. And what it was based on was this uh, huge growth trajectory, which showed that uh, Prince George was growing massively. And uh, the thought, not unreasonable, was that Prince George's population would continue to grow in the same way. So uh, the official community plan, the folks who were developing it, made some projections as they're expected to do. But what they projected is that at this time in our history, our population would be about 185,000 people. This takes you back to the growth of Prince George, and it's the same as uh, one of the boards that are around the room. This is Prince George in 1915. It was only five square kilometers at that time. It had the present downtown, Connaught Hill, most of the rail yard, and the Crescents area. And Prince George stayed that size until 1953. Between 1953 and 1974, though, the town grew, as you see on this map, 
And part of the reason for that was that the boundaries were expanded, and they were expanded about 11 times. So in 1974, the city had become 61 square kilometers. But that was nothing compared to the expansion that took place in 1975. In 1975, the area of the city became about five times bigger than it had been. Through amalgamation, the city then included the area north of the Nechaco River. It included Blackburn, the West Bowl, Cranbrook Hill, South Fort George, and College Heights. And again, the boundaries were growing in order to accommodate the increasing population and the industrial development that was taking place at that time. This is Prince George today. There were two smaller expansions that occurred, one in 1979 and one in 1995. And uh, Prince George is now 300 square kilometers. And that's not much bigger than it was in 1975. This takes us to the infrastructure story. So what this graph shows you, it uh, talks about the various types of infrastructure that we have. It talks about the below ground infrastructure, surface infrastructure, civic facilities, and parkland. And uh, as you'll see from this graph, with all of the very tall lines, most of the city's infrastructure was either built or acquired during the 1970s. And that's consistent with the times during which the population grew. Another interesting point of this graph is that the average date uh, during which the infrastructure was built was 1977. That makes the average age of our infrastructure about 42. And to give you an idea of what a 42-year-old piece of infrastructure looks like, and we wanted to pick one that was visible rather than the things that are underground, we found the Elk Center. So the Elk Center in the heart is about 42 years old, the average age of all of our infrastructure. So uh, half of our infrastructure is newer than the Elk Center, but half of it is also older than the Elk Center. We don't just look at ourselves in isolation, we also do benchmarking with other cities. The five cities that we chose to look at for the purposes of Talktober this year were Kamloops and Nanaimo. We also looked at Red Deer and Lethbridge, and we looked at Thunder Bay. We'll give you a summary of what we found out about those cities in comparison to Prince George. Thunder Bay and Kamloops are about the same size as Prince George. The other cities that we compared ourselves to are only about a third as large as Prince George is. Although the, the population of Prince George, as I mentioned earlier, in 1981 was the same as Kamloops and Nanaimo, it was even the same size as Kelowna, uh, all of the cities that we compared ourselves to now have more population than Prince George does. So we're in the position of Prince George having the biggest area and the smallest population. That gives us the lowest population density among our peer communities. And in fact, our population density is only a quarter of what it was in 1960. Our infrastructure is older than the other Western cities we compare ourselves to. And that's because of the boom that we had in the 1960s and 70s. And of the cities that we looked at, only Thunder Bay has infrastructure that's older than Prince George's is. So what do we do with all of this? Um, and what we do is basically called asset management. And the city has been doing a, a good job um, progressing in the area of asset management for many years. We've actually been leaders in this area. We began it with Frank Blues, who previously worked for us, and we're carrying on that great work through Christy Bobby and her team. One of the things that we do is called an infrastructure report card, and that's what you have before you on the screen. On one page of paper, this infrastructure report card shows a lot of things. It shows how much we have of an asset, in this case water, how old it is, what its condition is, what we use it for, and, and how much use it gets what we spend to maintain it, and most importantly, we look at the funding gap between what we are spending to maintain it and how much we should be spending to maintain it. 
We're going to use these infrastructure report cards this year during our budget deliberations with Council. We also have examples here if you'd care to look at them. In addition to uh, doing infrastructure report cards, we have a lot of information on our infrastructure. We do condition assessments for all of our buildings. We've been doing them for the past several years. We share best practices with other municipalities. Uh, we set self-sustaining utility fees. Uh, we regularly report to council. Prince George's costs of utilities are, are very high. Uh, the population with which we have to pay for them is, is small. We can pay for our utilities in a couple of ways. We can pay through, for them through the tax levy in terms of uh, repaying capital project costs. And we can also do it uh, by way of utility fees. We want to be sure that we're competitive with our peers. So every year we look at how we stand relative to them. These graphs are for 2019, so they're brand new. And what they show, we base everything on the representative home, at least for comparing ourselves with taxes. And as you can see from the graph, the representative home value from Prince George is much lower than our peers. We look then at uh, what the taxes people are paying based on that representative home. And you'll see from the graph that our taxpayers do pay more than Chilliwack, but they pay about the same as Kamloops, Kelowna, and Nanaimo, and they pay much less than Saanich and Victoria. On the utility rate side of things, we benchmark with about 30 Canadian municipalities, and we find that while our costs for utilities are higher, we have the lowest utility rates for water service, and we have, the, we have among the lowest rates for water service, and we have the lowest rates for sewer connections. The first is on road rehab and potholes. So you'll be aware that uh, the city has put targeted investment into road rehab for many years. We began many years ago, we were paying about a million dollars a year in road rehab, and then we went to two million. Uh, then for a period of time, we went to seven million dollars. Five million was the road rehab levy, and two million was from community works funding. We've since dropped back to uh, five million dollars on the levy and are spending the two million on other things, uh, parks and sidewalks. But we found with that targeted investment, the number of potholes we have is much less now than it used to be. We have about 70% uh, fewer potholes than in the days before we attended to that much needed infrastructure. The other success story that I mentioned earlier was with our playgrounds. We had a lot of playgrounds that were very old and were no longer safe. So through the park strategy, there was a conscious decision that was made to have fewer playgrounds and to invest money, $250,000 per year such that we would have some, some beautiful, safe, new playgrounds for children to play on. Coming up, we have some other infrastructure e needs that the city is investing in, and a number of these were the subject of the alternate approval process that occurred earlier this year. We'll be uh, reconstructing parts of the aquatic center. We'll enjoy having new roofs at a number of facilities. Old street lights are being replaced. There are going to be enhancements, further enhancements to Massage Place Stadium. And of course, we're very excited about uh, beginning the construction of the new pool in the new year. Right now, as uh, you can see, the day's end where the site for the new pool is going to be is in the process of being demolished. We've been making great progress in the downtown. You can see all of the projects on that map. Uh, in, we have Wood Innovation Square, which one of our newly completed project, and uh, the 7th Avenue streetscape is now open. Just out of the bounds of this photo, we also have the Public Library new entrance project. This is our integrated housing and health project. Many of the things that the city does is in partnership with uh, other agencies in the, t in the city. This is a very innovative partnership that we have with BC Housing and with Northern Health. The city's role in this project is to acquire a site, and we've done that on the NR Motor site on First Avenue. And uh, NHA will provide health services, and BC Housing will provide housing. So 
there will be uh, two phases to the project. Phase one will have 50 units of housing. Phase two will also have 50 units of housing. Northern Health will have 10,000 square feet of clinic space for each of the phases. So we're very much looking forward to that project where vulnerable people can live and get the support that they need where they live. In addition uh, to the health and housing project, we're doing a number of things downtown. We certainly understand the concerns of businesses and the community around the social issues that we have been having and uh, those have been increasing in recent years. So what we've done, again, with our partners, we have increased security downtown. We have bylaw compliance assistants who help with cleanups. We also have a dedicated RCMP uh, unit that works downtown. And in city facilities, we've contracted some security in places like the Four Seasons Pool. We have events that downtown PG helps us with, together with other partners. And uh, we continue to remove graffiti so that we can, if we see graffiti, we take it down quickly uh, so that it doesn't encourage further graffiti. And council continues to work on uh, having derelict buildings demolished. Emergency planning, we've been doing a lot of work on that in the last couple of years. This map shows evacuation jo zones and they correspond to garbage collection zones so that they're top of mound when, uh, in case there is the need to evacuate, we want to quickly know where our zone is and where we will need to evacuate to. Uh, we continue to communicate about emergency planning and you can get more information and alerts on that through our website. We're also communicating with the public on wildfire risk and we'll be doing some information sessions on that next week. They'll be on October 8th and 10th and they'll be in the Heart and College Heights for those who are interested. Council's also been doing some work on snow removal. We aim to continuously improve and so we want to do a, a better job of that all the time. As a result of that, administration has brought a new snow and ice control policy to council, which has been approved. The policy identifies priority snow removal routes, as it always has, and in addition to that, it includes uh, sidewalks. There is now a heavy snowfall declaration uh, that can be implemented when there's uh, snow that falls in excess of 20 centimeters in a 24-hour period. And that's to alert travelers that uh, perhaps, uh, if they're able, that they should do less road travel than they normally would to allow crews to clear the streets. 